I have been with this foundation for the last almost 10 years and from the beginning we have been slowly expanding our work with rural population particularly the farmers and so I will focus on the example of what it meant for us to work with small farmers and here I just want to clarify that you know 85 percent of farmers in India in numbers are small and marginal farmers that is farmers who have land holding of less than one hectare which is roughly two and odd acres of land. Now if you look at that section of the population which represent 85 percent of them you know, I think their condition has been worse than any set of population you can think of in terms of ability to manage risks much more than investment bankers at their best of times because the kind of challenges they have had to go through is you know phenomenal and I will I insist on sort of drawing uh, the, the seriousness of their life for us to have a look at it. One because of land reforms and a variety of other valuable things that this nation has done they have small land holdings which fundamentally means that anything that they have to do does not have economies of scale. So if you have to buy any inputs it is expensive, if you want to sell anything it is expensive, the production looks bad and in fact the only country probably in most of the developed and developing nations where a, a farmer's life is condemned to a small land holding. I mean Australia you use helicopters to, to spray pesticides, in America a farmer is a celebrity you know in the sense of the term in terms of the kind of subsidies they get etc etc. Here it is a different situation. Second very poor infrastructure. When I say infrastructure all the places that we work in Nandi foundation from the hills in Nagaland to the hills in Andhra Pradesh and Orissa to Andaman Nicobar Islands. My biggest challenge even today has been that except for a few microfinance institutions that too very few uh, no banker is even willing to have a bank account open for these farmers. So institutional support even in the sense of banking does not exist forget roads infrastructure to go anywhere and sell anything it is just complete cut off that small and marginal farmer in especially rich ecosystems especially eco fragile areas of fields etc are concerned. So that is that is the second thing we have to be worried about. Third their entire connection with markets and others you know, you know has been doing focus work on it uh, is all about going through series of middlemen you know. Um, they, therefore, if you want credit, if you want market, you go through a series of it, and that explains why you have to have even you know uh, a rise for the farmer for the last 50 years. Paddy has been always 400 rupees at best for a bag, and and which is which translate to two to three rupees a kg, and we've never had rice in the last 10 years, which was less than 20 rupees. I'm not even talking about basmati rice, I'm talking about regular rice. So this, whether it was paddy or any crop the distinctions in terms of price has been because of middlemen. So given the whole issue and then there is a larger challenge in which not touching on the Vidarbha suicides but I think there is this whole issue of given all this and the knowledge economies and the, and the borderless worlds making all of us in rural India all, all of the people in rural India sort of more consumerist and you cannot blame them for that um, leads everyone to be also in a sense greedy so having to look for increased means shorter ways by which you can increase your wealth and all of them therefore having to move from sustained agricultural practices to unsustained ones. I am not taking a position on not using pesticides and fertilizers but well we work with 100,000 farmers who do not use it and use organic farming but that is not a position I am getting into but the fact that they in relation to their land holding in relation to the resources they have at their disposal they jump shift their cropping pattern from a something that they are used to culturally move to a cash crop sometimes cotton sometimes BT cotton sometimes a new crop like vanilla and then have to invest heavily uh, a different set of financial resources which they were not used to. So they get into debts and eventually you because you are not able to manage them well and they are cut off from mainstream agricultural practices they end up having a crop loss. The only way you get to know about is it when there is a political largest of x hundred crores given away in terms of you know repayment for the debt. The, the, the problem continues to remain there the farmers paradigm is just not touched and this is 60 year story. I yeah. will therefore draw the example to a specific work that we have been doing with 10,000 tribals. This is up in the hills in Andhra Pradesh bordering Orissa. None of them had more than half to one acre land and these were hills where their main job was three months of uh, you know what is called a shifting cultivation of paddy and then if possible slash and burn cultivation plus depend on timber or do wage earning. 
what we could do was to get them all to get an acre of land from government on lease. Although these were Adivasis, they didn't have land of their own. Adivasis are tribals, the bit better understood in these parts of the world, but first citizens of this country who inhabited the region don't have land of their own, so they live as nomadics. And when I ask them which is their land, they don't have a paper to show that. But when we got them together and made them to grow what was traditionally being grown there by the government, in this case coffee and black pepper, we could have the 10,000 of them like to uh, go to the example of Operation Flood, um, the, the, the White Revolution, the Koreans, we could get them together to grow coffee as a collective. So we have 10,000 farmers come under as a collective, grow coffee using organic materials and organic farming practices. We found that the cost of growing coffee for them was phenomenally one tenth of what it was anywhere else in the country. A. B, they all came together to realize that this coffee is going to be purchased directly by fair trade buyers in Europe or organic purchasers in Europe and rest of the world. So all we had to do was once they were together as a collective, just ensure there are no middlemen and link them straight to the buyers. And we just did the facilitation role of linking them up and not even keeping any money at our end. It was all left to the cooperative to keep a 10 percent uh, you know, overheads for them to keep. You found that historically when they were selling coffee in India as a small farmer for 60 rupees a kg, the last four years they've been getting an average of 160 rupees a kg. Simply because they reaped the economies of scale, they increased their productivity and they reduced their cost because they went organic in this context. This is not a template for you know, across the board rep replication, but I'm using an example to say that if you want to address rural livelihoods from a small farmer perspective, you need to bring them together into collectives and economies of scale and you need to bring in the convergence model we have in metros for our services and ensure that you are able to link them with institutional access for financial services, markets and maybe then they are in a position to even remotely stand up and compete. So unless this becomes a viable model and, and what can state do about it, state can push it in terms of policies, in terms of very, very focused subsidies, very focused directives that go in the direction. I know of, you know, across Andhra Pradesh, for instance, how entire mangroves were destroyed because there was a huge subsidy and incentive on aquaculture because you wanted to promote it at one fine day. The, the, the kind of, you know, influence a state policy can do is phenomenal. I mean, if you can bring about subsidies in eco-fragile regions which, which allow these small farmers to congregate, if you allow financial institutions to give them credit in a particular manner that it is accessible for these groups, a whole host of those what I call as value chains that are needed to be brought in an inclusive manner, you probably can then take them out of, of, and of, of the perils of poverty that they are trapped in. And till such time we address small farmers, and I am someone who has seen it and believe that global food crisis solutions are not going to be in large farms, but it has to be in small farms where they are not left to isolate into isolated fights of their own, but they are brought to mainstream where whether it is contract farming, whether it is institutional support, whether it is an in NGO interface, we have different players come together and make small farmer your partner in a manner that there is a win-win situation. Till such time this becomes order of the day, I am sorry to, to leave on this very horrifying note, we will find rural India soon transforming into a hotbed for terrorist recruitment. Yeah. And I am saying this because I work in Chhattisgarh, I work in Chambal Valley and I work in places where I find my farmers children being taken away for 5000 rupees to become a Naxal. So you, you really have a reason to think that life of a small farmer is beyond food security. It's, it's beyond energy consumption issues. It's about it going to affect each and everyone's lives and the way we bequeath our society to our children.